Father God, uh, I just thank you for people committed to this class, committed to your word, committed to know what's going on in the world and how it relates to what the word of God has to teach. And Father, you know these are very discouraging times in which we live. And there's just the attempt, as we're going to see today, just to take you off the throne and put something else there. And so I pray, God, that you would just bless us as we make this study. I pray for Becky. Lord, I feel so bad for her. She's been in such pain as she has acknowledged, and I can understand that. I, I pray, God, that you would bring quick healing. We'd certainly like her back in class as soon as possible. So honor, God, your word today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we want to talk about the religion of the satanic green dragon. And it deals with the idea when a man worships Gaia, and you'll understand who Gaia is, rather than the creator. And it's all based on the words of the Apostle Paul, too, in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, where God's wrath is coming down on people who are worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It was the summer of 1992 that leftist politicians, New Age mystics, environmental activists from all over the world met in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil for what was billed as the Earth Summit. The event attracted a veritable who's who in international elites, including a delegation of U.S. Senators of both parties, led by John Kerry and soon-to-be Vice President Al Gore. The summit began with the participants kneeling around the circle which had been drawn on the ground where they were all united in prayer. Now the question is, to whom were they praying? I read something from John Hagee on this, pastor of a church in Texas. We've talked about John Hagee in past lessons. Anyway, he speaks of investigating this and discovered that when Satanists pray, they kneel in a circle. Mm -hmm. His conclusion was the first earth summit began with a ceremony dedicated to Satan. Hagee appears to be right, because what I want to share right now is the paganization of the environment. I want you to understand what this environmental movement is all about. It's become a religion, and Satan is behind it. The original Earth Summit has given way to a series of glitzy, annual UN-sponsored events known as the United Nations Climate Change Conference, the most recent of which was held in November 2022 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Participants were greeted with giant posters reading, Welcome to Egypt, the Dawn of Conscience, featuring the Egyptian sun god symbol as part of the official logo of the event. In the center of the posters was a bizarre message from an ancient Egyptian document supposedly written 4,000 years ago. It included, among other messages, a stated confession of sin. I have not polluted the water or the earth. Can you imagine that? That, that thought goes back 4,000 years, they say. There was a call. Faith leaders of the world unite. This environmental conference in Egypt was not alone in praying tribute to pagan deities. In this case, the Egyptian sun god, Ra. The 2010 conference in Cancun, Mexico, opened with a prayer to Eshel, the Mayan goddess of cannibalism human sacrifice and war, claiming that the goddess was associated with creativity. In 2012, the famous Christ the Redeemer statue overlooking the city of Rio de Janeiro was lit up by green lights for the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, a term used to refer to the Great Reset of the World Economic Forum. Lord Christopher Montkin, who served as science advisor to 
UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher spoke about the green appearance of the Christ the Redeemer statue as a, and I quote, a kind of childish message that the environmental religion is now replacing Christianity. What we're going to see at this conference in Egypt is a mockery of the Ten Commandments. The November 2022 Environmental Conference in Egypt made mockery of the Ten Commandments. Its location in the Sinai Peninsula was not far from the historically held view of the location of Mount Sinai, where Moses supposedly received the Ten Commandments. Though the scriptures speak of Mount Sinai as being in Arabia, not Egypt, that's in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. In a summation of an article of the New American by Alex Newman, January the 16th of this year, Newman writes, and he was at this conference. At Mount Sinai, self-proclaimed religious leaders gathered from pagans and Muslims to Christians and Jews. These religious leaders walked up to the top of Mount Sinai where they each received green tablets referred to as the New Ten Commandments. The assembled faithful kicked off the Sinai Climate Partnership with a climate repentance, repenting of their carbon dioxide emissions and other environmental sins. After a period of confession, green energy guru, Joseph Abramowitz, also president of a solar energy company, smashed the tablets as if he were Moses. And looking down on 125 heads of state of government said, we are not satisfied. The political leadership of the world has not come through on climate until now, he fumed. Things are just getting worse. We are calling on faith leaders to add to the sense of urgency and to have that way in hopefully, forcefully, and globally to push for the reduction by 50% at least of global warming emissions by 2030, reducing emissions so gradually, notice he says, is immoral, immoral at this point. So what we're seeing now, and we talked about this last week, is uh, part of the agenda of the World Economic Forum for 2030 is to unite world religions. And so one way by which they want to do that is through the environmental movement. So uh, Calvin Beisner, who specializes in Christian theology and the environment issues, has this to say about Abramowitz's tirade. I'm quoting him now. Moses smashed the stone tablets in anger at the Israelites' apostasy from the faith of Yahweh, their God, who had delivered them from the slavery of Egypt. Their worshiping the idols was synchristic, trying to weave together the religion of Yahweh and the polytheistic religion of Egypt. But the Sinai Climate Partnership is nothing if it is not a synchristic wedding of modern Judaism and other religions. And when we talk about syncretism here, we're, we're talking about syncing two different or more religions together, see. So uh, we want to get the environmentalism as a part of other religions. Got that? Weisner continued by saying that the conference leaders, and I'm quoting him now, were duped into putting their religious improvators onto an event which was anything but Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu. Its real purpose was to further the social goals, the socialist goals, <laughs> the socialist goals of the climate alarmist movement. Yet enlisting world religious leaders and getting them behind the environmental cause as well as Agenda 23 is critical to its success. So they want all of us religious leaders now to get behind the environmental movement so that Agenda 2030, which we spoke about last week, can get properly implemented on time. Yeah. Even Pope Francis has been one of the early advocates for Agenda 
2030, even speaking at the UN General Assembly about the importance of the global scheme, and he's right in line with George Soros, the Rockefellers, and more, who brought about a thousand religious leaders to Germany in 2019 to promote the entire Agenda 2030 of the World Economic Forum, which includes, this again, what we talked about last week, borderless nations, a cashless society, a government takeover of all private property, and strict regulations imposed on all corporations, businesses, and individuals concerning the environment in order to save Mother Earth. Prominent journalist Leo Pullman, a Christian, noted that projecting the, quote, agenda of evil globalist predators through the ceremonies of the new Ten Commandments represent, quote, major blasphemy in action on the part of these fake faith leaders. Climate hysteria, Pullman writes, is earth worship. We're going to talk about this. What, what is earth worship? Well, we're going to go into great detail on it. Just hang in there. He's saying it's earth worship. And a key component of the coming one world religion, we are seeing it in full display in Egypt at the United Nations Climate Conference. So when we talk about earth worship, who's the goddess in this case? And the goddess is Gaia. So there's a passion for earth worship of the goddess Gaia. And that's, that's what I want us to see what this is all about. Nature worship is very big, especially among the world's elitists and the millennials as well as the younger generation. I know I've told this story a few times in the class, but it's so germane to what we're talking about here. When Kathy and I took a tour of Scandinavia, we were outside of Copenhagen, Denmark, where we visited a park full of beautiful trees. One young lady on the tour, somehow knowing I was a pastor, came up to me and challenged me to hug a tree. <laughs> she said, go hug that tree. It will get you in touch with nature and make you feel good. <laughs> so I accepted the challenge and I wrapped my arms around the trunk of a big tree. Don't you feel better now? She said, no. I replied, I don't feel any different. Now, I wish, I, I wish I would have said to her, I didn't. I'm ashamed of it. I worship the creator, not the creation. But I had the experience of hugging a tree. <laughs> the Apostle Paul learns about such sin that brings down the wrath of God by speaking of people who exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1.25. Even churches are getting involved in nature worship. You'll enjoy a couple of stories here. The first parish Unitarian church, which I don't consider a Christian church at all, but they call themselves a church. This one in Brookline, Massachusetts, conducted a funeral for a 100-year-old tree that stood on the edge of the church property on a school construction site. City officials felt its large branches would hang too close to the school, posing a danger to the children. The city wanted it removed, and a 19-month legal battle ensued, and in the end, the courageous tree lost the fight. The Reverend David Johnson could not keep his composure without breaking down at a special funeral for the tree. The deceased tree, cut down by the city, had its dismembered parts surrounded by burning candles and fragrant flowers. In eulogizing the tree, Reverend Johnson quoted from a poem which asks, Is there a more unnerving sound than the hideous screech of a buzzsaw at work? It's an anti-sound, he says. A December 2002 edition of the Washington Times had an article that asked a question concerning driving SUVs and hurting children through global warming. 
The question was raised by Reverend Bob Edgar, General Secretary of the National Council of Churches. Now, that's where all of the mainline Protestant churches are part of the National Council of Churches. It's a very, very liberal organization. Anyway, uh, the General Secretary of the NCC, this is this Bob Edgar, he asked the question, what car would Jesus drive? <laughs> It was part of a campaign by people of faith to boost environmental awareness. One response came from an evangelical, a man by the name of Jim Ball of the Environmental Network. Ball jokingly referred to Psalm 83, which urges the Lord to persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. Mm -hmm. Ball concluded that Jesus would drive a Pontiac tempest and a geo storm. <laughs> Neither of those cars are made today. The Reverend Edgar was not amused by the response, yet the very first responsibility God gave to mankind was to have dominion over his creation, Genesis 1.26. So we are to be good environmentalists. We all want clean air to breathe and pure water to drink and a well manicured environment to enjoy. However, there's a vast difference between a godly Christian approach to caring for the environment than the current green agenda of today's environmentalists. In the late 1990s, I've got this story in, in my book, and I, I think that I've used this story even in this class some time back. But anyway. In the late 1990s, a liberal movement called Progressive Christianity. There's, there's such a church right here at Irvine, by the way. Uh, a, ch a church that identifies itself as Progressive Christianity. Uh, this whole movement sprung up uh, in the uh, late 90s. And, and, and it's a movement that is also called the Green Religion. So if you see something that's marked progressive Christianity, it, it has to do with the green religion. Uh, it most likely originated, this progressive Christianity, most likely originated out of Union Theological Seminary in New York City, which has long been a bastion of Christian apostasy. In September of 2019, students were directed by the school's president, Dr. Serene Jones, to participate in a chapel service where one at a time, students sat at the foot of a group of plants and confessed to the plants their sins against the environment. <laughs> can, can, you, can you imagine? Can you imagine what's going on? In this crazy world today, we, uh, I, Kathy loves plants, and we've got thousands of them around the house. Uh, am I going to bow before every one of them and confess my sin to those plants? Oh my. I want you to see that we Christians now, this shouldn't surprise us at all, we Christians are blamed for the current environmental crisis. Yes, we Christians, especially we evangelicals, are to blame for our current ecological crisis. The noted historian Lynn White Jr. of UCLA wrote a paper titled, The Historical Roots of Our, of our Ecology Crisis. Saw this paper. I'm quoting from it. Christianity is largely responsible for the environmental crisis. Religion has a major influence on man's behavior. When did Christianity tell people about their relations with the environment? It was Christianity that insisted it is God's will that man exploit nature for his, God's, proper ends. Huh? I didn't find that in the Bible. By destroying, now here's the key thing. By destroying pagan animism. That's nature worship. See, Christianity came along and destroyed pagan animism, the worship of nature. Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference. We're no longer uh, animacy. Uh, well, we're coming. That's where we are today. 
Well, I'm not surprised that we Christians are blamed for smog, global warming, and the health of planet Earth. One thing we can say with certainty, animism has been made a major comeback since Professor White wrote this paper. Worshiping Mother Nature has replaced the worship of God who created nature and has resurrected in his place the goddess Gaia. So let's, uh, let's talk about this goddess Gaia and a living earth. Uh, I had quite a discussion with a man. Uh, actually, I, I bought another car, and so the guy that was selling me the car, we got into a discussion on whether or not the earth was living. And uh, he was a liberal, and of course you know who I am, so. Uh, it was quite a discussion that we had, but uh, I'll explain how they think. That's what I want to do here. There's a question of some controversy today, and that is, is the earth a living creature? This question gives rise to what's called the Gaia hypothesis. Now, who is Gaia? Gaia is the Greek earth goddess, the new age darling of spiritual feminists, neo-pagans, political environmentalists, and animal rights activists. So if you fit that crowd, I don't think anyone here did, if you fit that crowd, uh, you must believe in the Gaia hypothesis. The Gaia hypothesis is the scientific expression of the pre-Christian belief that the earth is a living creature. With me? This whole idea was advanced about 30 years ago by James Lovelock, an atmospheric scientist and inventor. He is no charlatan, but a respected member of Britain's elite royal society. He believed the earth is living, and his theory was called the Gaia Hypothesis. The entire theory of a living earth is rooted in the history of evolution. It maintains that billions of years ago, life on earth formed from a bacterial ooze that began to grow and evolve into all forms of life as we have on earth. The Gaia hypothesis undermines biblical creation by imputing a kind of divine power to the earth while offering a science that resonates with ancient mysticism. Now here's how this whole thing is explained. William Irwin Thompson, a former professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, stated we are all Organellas, I'm going to explain this term, I didn't have a clue what it meant, but I'll help you find it here. Anyway, we are all organellas within a planetary cell. Now, an organella is a cell organ, a specialized part of a cell having some specific function. So from out of the original bacterial ooze of the primeval earth, cells were formed with specific functions that over billions of years evolved into all the various life forms we have today, from plants to animals, humans, and so forth. The earth itself is one giant planetary cell that acts like an incubator to create and nourish the various life forms. This makes the earth a living being and the source of all living things. Gaia is goddess earth or mother earth and the concern of the modern environmental movement is that we are choking her to death with fossil fuels and carbon monoxide filling the atmosphere. Unless we act quickly, we only have a few years left to survive. So, just to kind of that's a little complicated, but let me just kind of summarize what I just said here. So you have the earth, and you have this, this bacterial ooze that somehow developed. See? And uh, I'll explain that as, as we move a little forward. But you have this bacterial ooze, and this bacterial ooze created these organelles, these, these cells, and in these cells there are the traits through the process of evolution over millions of years of time to form all life as we have it today. And the earth is like an incubator that protects these organellas, say, and helps them grow. Therefore, the earth is alive. 
See? And what we're doing today is killing the earth. We got to get rid of fossil fuels. See? And toilet paper and incandescent light bulbs and gas stoves and gas fireplaces. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, what's the theology of goddess God? What 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 does this religious what does this green movement, this green new deal movement, what do they really believe? We're going to talk about the theology of Goddess Gaia here. During the 1990s, the Gaia hypothesis has moved from a theory to a theology. There's, they have a doctrine now. In Lovelock's book, Gaia, the, A New Look at Life on Earth, he writes this. Gaia may be the first religion with a testable scientific theory embedded in it. While there are environmentalists who despise calling the Gaia hypothesis a religion because they hate religion, at least one environmentalist mellowed on the idea saying, Gaia is less harmful than standard religion. It can be a very environment, it can be very environmentally aware. At least it is not human centered. So, so, so what he's saying here, uh, Christianity is human-centered. Uh, Judaism is human-centered. It's just an invention of man. It's all myths. But, but at least this uh, Gaia hypothesis, this, this green religion, has some uh, sense to it. It has some scientific basis behind it. Gaia worship has become a religion, a green, what I'm calling a green satanic dragon, that is tempting and drawing much attention as it seeks to wed pseudoscience with philosophy to offer an anti-biblical approach to the origin of the universe and the existence of life. Its doctrine can be understood now in the following ways. So here is the creed of uh, those in the environmental movement. One, Gaia worshipers teach the God of the Bible does not exist. The book of Genesis begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is the most attacked verse in the Bible by atheists and Gaia worshipers. If somehow science could disprove this verse, it would have dire consequences on the rest of the Bible and the validity of the Christian faith. I maintain that Genesis 1-1 may well be the most important verse in all the Bible. If somehow that verse could be disproved, it would have a drastic effect on our faith, would it not? And what we believe about the rest of the Bible. Anyway, two, Gaia worshipers teach the earth has been imputed with divine powers while offering a science that resonates with ancient mysticism. Lovelock compares Gaia's appeal to that of the Virgin Mary. Get this, this, this is great. I mean, stupid, but I, I want you to comprehend it. So Lovelock compares Gaia's appeal to that of the Virgin Mary. What if Mary is another name for Gaia? Then her capacity for virgin birth is no miracle, or parthenogenic aberration. It is the role of Gaia since life began. Now, we, some terms here we need to understand. What, what is meant by a parthenogenic aberration? The word parthenogenic refers to asexual reproduction, the development of an embryo without fertilization. Follow me? So something comes to life but there's no sex involved in that being created. So that is, as the Virgin Mary, this is what they would say now, as the Virgin Mary supposedly gave birth to the baby Jesus without the male sperm, so Gaia is like the aberration of the Virgin Mary. She gave birth to all life on earth in a non-sexual way. 
That is not only blasphemy against the Virgin Mary, as Gaia worshippers deny that supernatural birth, yet they use it to explain how Gaia created life in a non-sexual way. Three, Gaia worshippers teach that the earth talks to herself and to us. And the theory is based on what's called the language of Gaia. According to Rolona, Patty Kreider of the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, Gaia, talks to herself and to us, her children, and if we are addicted, confused, and express disempowering tendencies, Gaia reacts with earthquakes, fall, uh, tornadoes, floods, and extreme weather changes that forces us to reassess our values, work together, and create a way of life anew. So when Gaia is unhappy with her human creation, say, she erupts in catastrophic ways as a means of communicating her displeasure. So that's how Gaia speaks to us. So when uh, we have a big tornado or an earthquake, hey, Gaia is not very happy. Three, four, Gaia worshipers teach the earth is female in gender and hence the phrase Mother Earth or Mother Nature. Now, that's kind of interesting in light of today when they don't even know what a female is. <laughs> we'll talk about that next week. Uh, yeah. It'll be sadly humorous. A female goddess is far more interesting to feminists than all the male gods of history, and especially the father and son god of Christianity. See, we got to get away from the idea of speaking of gods in a male sense, patriarchal sense. Five, Gaia worshippers teach the theory of evolution, which denies that each species or kind was individually created, as we read in Genesis chapter 1, thus stating that all living things are related as one specific, uh, and as one species, rather, as one species evolved into another, so our most distant relatives are algae and the amoeba. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when you go back in time and there's some algae and the algae, uh, eventually evolved into an amoeba, the amoeba eventually evolved into fish, the fish eventually evolved into some, uh, uh, like a lizard or a, a water, like we call them, uh, amphibious being. The amphibious beings developed into birds, the birds developed into mammals, the mammals developed into man. See, it's an evolutionary process, and if you follow that all the way back, right, we're related to algae, but if you want to go back further than that, we're all related to a rock because the rock became the first source of life. So the evolutionists tell us. Though they don't want to admit that we came from a rock because they don't want to have us say they have rocks in their hip. <laughs> Number six. Gaia worshippers teach that humans have no special status among living creatures. This will mm -hmm. blow your mind if you've not heard this. One noted PETA activist, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, a guy by the name of Ralph uh, Matzner, compares human beings to a cancer spreading the globe. Humanity has a reckless disregard for the delicately balanced interrelationships of the whole system. The notion that human beings are intrinsically more valuable than a tree or a bug is now construed as a form of bigotry. If you think you are worth more than a tree or a bug, you're a bigot. Hear that? Stupid! Instead, all organisms are seen as virtually interrelated, and all plants and animals have a right to survive. Well, I don't have a problem with that line. Dean Coons, an animal activist and novelist, said, a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. 
Dr. Stephen Hawking, in an interview with Diane Sawyer in 2010, said, man is insignificant in the whole scheme of things. Other quotes I came across from anonymous sources, we human beings are nothing but a skin of disease on a ball of dirt. Another quote, what makes man human is a usable thumb. Dolphins are smarter than we are, but they don't have a thumb. They, they just swim. Oh my. Now what does the scripture say about us? As human beings, we have been made in the image and likeness of God, and we are to have dominion over all of God's creation. This is said about no other creation of God. No, God didn't uh, say to a dog or to a cat that you're made in my image, say. Only we humans. I know some of you cat lovers might not like that, but <laughs> we're, we're better than a, a cat. Let's, let's understand. Our pets, we're better than that. We have more worth. Anyway, David writes this in Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 9. But this tells us what God thinks of us. David writes, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have placed all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, that is O oh Yahweh, our Lord, O oh Yahweh, our Lord, O oh Yahweh, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Now, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, which of these two makes you feel better about yourself? Which of these two views? The Gaia worshiper who says we are no better than a tree or a bug? Or your Christian faith which says we are made in God's image and likeness and we were created a little lower than the angels and are crowned with glory and honor? It doesn't take much intelligence to make that decision. That shows you how stupid the environmentalists are. Number seven, Gaia worshippers teach the earth is overpopulated and the world population needs to be reduced to 500 million people, meaning over 7 billion people need to be eliminated in order to, quote, maintain humanity in perpetual balance with nature. This is one of the goals, this is, this is one of the goals of the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum placed an ad promoting their agenda. We have only one Earth, a living planet that helps sustain life. We have discovered this life system is in crisis. Fresh water, clean air, good soil, things we invest in to stay alive. After all, who wants to pollute the water and the land? They've been looking at the communist uh, China government's one-child policy. They support worldwide abortion on demand at any stage of development. Infanticide means killing the baby after the baby is born. They support that euthanasia for the elderly and the disabled who cannot be productive to society. Folks, most, you know, we're, most of us in this room are, I guess, kind of elderly with you. Yeah, we meet that. So, so the World Economic Forum is saying you, you don't have any value anymore. If you don't have any value anymore, you don't deserve to live. You understand? Oh, yeah. Dr. Eric Planka, professor at the University of Texas in March 2006, publicly advocated killing 90% of the world's population with a genetic advanced, get this, Ebola virus. Hmm. Wonder what that COVID was all about. Immediate uh, mogul Ted Turner recently advocated the world population be reduced by 95%. Well, I'd like for him to go. <laughs> Some have suggested the use of manufactured diseases and vaccines to kill off the population. I heard Senator Rand Paul in his debate on the floor of Congress with Dr. Anthony Fauci speak about China manufacturing a virus. 
that could kill between 15 to 50 percent of the world's population. And you, I, I just saw this in Epoch Times this last week. There is a new virus, a new COVID spreading through China. How long is it going to take to get here? We're, we're going we're gonna to be back, you know, where we were before. Environmentalists, environmentalists are telling us that Mother Gaia must be protected in order for life to survive, and this will be at the expense of human life and population reduction. Whew. Let's talk about the plan of God to care for the earth and the environment. Let's, uh, let's see what God has to say about all this. So I'm going to lay down some principles here. We need to respect the earth as belonging to the Lord. It was King David who wrote, the earth is the Lord's, Yahweh. In other words, the earth belongs to Yahweh in all its fullness, the world and all who dwell therein. We must never think of this planet as Mother Earth or the goddess Gaia. It belongs to the Lord, for he alone created it. We must never forget that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is Lord over his church and Lord over the nations and governments of the world. He is Lord over all his creation. Abraham Kuyper, Dutch theologian and former prime minister of Netherlands from 1901 to 1905 said, in the total expanse of human life, there is not a single square inch of which the Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare, that is mine. Amen. So we need to respect the earth as belonging to the Lord. Secondly, realize that mankind has a responsibility toward God's creation. The first commandment God gave to mankind even before his creation was to rule over the earth. Then God said, this is Genesis 1 beginning at verse 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Hmm. Male and female. We're coming back to this next week. Male and female, he created them. Now when the text says that we are created in the image of God, this image was imparted only to human forms, human beings. Of no animal is it said they were created in God's image. That makes us a very unique creature that lives on this planet. The word image is used figuratively there in Genesis. For God does not have a human form. Jesus says he is spirit, John 4, 24. And then Jesus said a spirit does not have flesh and bones, Luke 24, verse 39. That's a problem for Mormons, by the way, who believe that God has human form or had human form. Ah, no, spirit does not have flesh and bones. Being in God's image means that humans share, though imperfectly and finitely, in God's nature. We have been given a mind to think and know, a heart to feel and have emotion, and a will to respond to what we know and how we feel. He has given us the spiritual capacity to know him and have fellowship with him. He created us a little lower than the angels, Psalm 8, 5, which we read earlier, to be good stewards of planet Earth, not to pollute the planet unnecessarily or waste the resources that God has given us. The initial intent of God was that mankind would have dominion <coughs> to rule over the Earth. But when sin entered the world and God's curse was placed on his creation, we lost that dominion. The writer of Hebrews, and we covered this but some time back now, the writer of Hebrews, in speaking of mankind, said, get this down, he put all in subjection under him, that is mankind. He left nothing that is not put under him, that is mankind. But now, here's the key phrase, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. Hmm. What's that suggest to us? Well, we lost our dominion over the earth because of the curse and because of the fall. 
That does not mean we don't have a responsibility to care for the earth and all life therein. For though fallen in nature, we are still created in his image. And while we should care for all life, I'm sure we have permission, by the way, to swat flies and crush mosquitoes. I enjoy doing that. <laughs> I believe God created these pesky and annoying insects to remind us how Satan works. Remember, Satan is called in Scripture Beelzebub. The word means Lord of the Flies. So you have permission to swat flies. However, the day will come when Christ rules over this earth, and we will rule and reign with him. We've talked about that many times. Revelation 26 tells us that. That is chapter 20, verse 6. It will be during the millennium when God's initial plan for man will be realized and we will be given dominion over God's new creation. Next. Recognize that the earth is very is a very resilient plant. Planet. Not plant. Planet. Get a little water here. Okay. You need to recognize the earth is a very resilient planet. The earth has been around for thousands of years. Some say 4.5 billion years. That would be the late earthers. Man's contribution to environmental pollution are paltry compared to those of nature. This will, if you haven't heard this before, this will, this section will startle you. I'd like to know what AOC would have to say about this. The biggest contributors to CO2 is not man, but nature. The book, Trashing the Planet, by former Atomic Energy Commission Chairman Dr. Dixie Lee Ray, noted that based on the available data, all of the air polluting materials produced by man since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution do not begin to equal the quantities of toxic materials, aerosols, and particulates spewed into the air from just three volcanoes. Krakatoa in Indonesia in 1883, Mount Kitmaya in Alaska in 1912, and Hekla in Iceland in 1947, added this Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980, which pumped out 910,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide alone, El Chacon, in Mexico in 1982, spent 100 million tons of sulfur, said rather, 100 million tons of sulfur gases into the atmosphere. Mount Pinatuba, uh, Mount Pinatubo, I guess it is, in the Philippines in 1992 hurled upwards of 30 million tons of material into the atmosphere. Sundry animals and insects contribute their share of environmental degradation. Uh, missing my, can't get my tongue tied up here. Anyway, Time Magazine, April the 20th, 1992, noted that in the Netherlands, I'm quoting now from Time, the Netherlands, mature, uh, manure from pigs poses a major ecological threat defiling water supplies with excessive nitrates and acidifying a local soil. Sheep have permanently scarred the landscape in Spain and Portugal, while in India, cows, or bovines, it uses in the article, are ravenous wraiths whose constant quest for food drives them to ravage the forest. And let's not forget cow flatulence. I think you know what that is. You don't want to smell it which spews more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than all the automobiles and trucks combined worldwide. And that's why they're putting flagellant bags on the back end of cows to catch all of the you-know-what. <laughs> yes, they are. I had a picture of it in class, I think, when you were not here. I showed a picture of a, of a cow. With, with one of these bags attached to its rear end so that it catches all the gas that comes out and it doesn't go into the atmosphere. Wow. 
Well, uh, <laughs> some of it probably eats out. I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's not my problem. <laughs> The February 1983 issue of Science Digest reported that an international team of researchers has discovered that termites generate more than twice the carbon dioxide that fuel burning does. According to a study reported in Science for November 5th, 1982, quote, the estimated gross amount of carbon dioxide produced by termites was more than twice the net global input from fossil fuel combustion. In addition, termites are a potentially important source of atmospheric methane. They could account for a large fraction of global emissions. The wood-eating pests have a bacterium that enables them to digest carbon so effectively that some 90% is converted to CO2, methane, and other gases they belch into the atmosphere. So we have a problem with termites. Ants are another natural source of pollution. Cornell University reported that ants store huge quantities, quantities rather, huge quantities of the formic acid that contributes most to the acidity, to the rain that falls in remote areas and is found in atmospheric gas and precipitation around the globe. It is abundant in the fog and mist that hang over the rainforest in Central Africa. Insight Magazine, July the 6th, 1987, carried an article stating, ants release the acid when defending themselves and communicating with each other and when dying. There is significant concern about the acid in ant release. An amount estimated, get this, at 600,000 metric tons annually, which is equal to the combined formic acid combination uh, or contributions of automobiles, refuge, combustion, and vegetation. I don't think we'll get rid of ants or termites very soon. Nature is more guilty of polluting the atmosphere than is man. The late cosmologist Robert Jastrow, one of the most respected scientists of our time, former head of Gothard Institute of Space Studies, said global warming is due to changes in the sun, not greenhouse gases. So the earth is very resilient. And long before the Industrial Revolution, since sin originated in the Garden of Eden, the earth was cursed, and nature itself has been a polluter of the atmosphere. Clearly, man has a long way to go to match nature as a despoiler of the environment. Then finally, we need to remember that God controls the weather and not man. The psalmist wrote how the forces of nature are controlled by God. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. That's Psalm 148, verse 8. It was Job who writes of thunder and lightning, snow and whirlwind, bitter cold, ice and rain are all caused by God, whether for, get this now, whether for correction, as discipline, or for his land, so the crops can grow, or for mercy. That's Job chapter 37, verse 13 verses. The prophet Nahum wrote, The Lord, that is Yahweh, has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. That's Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. So God uses weather and natural disasters as a form of remedial judgment. It is one of his ways of reminding sinful people of his great power and of a future judgment to come. Job has assured us that God sends bad weather and natural disasters, notice, for correction, discipline. It is one of his ways to get our attention and to call us to repentance. When the Northridge earthquake hit California in January of 1994, remember that? 
It was centered in the cities of Northridge, Chatsworth, and Canoga Park, cities that are home to nearly all of the billions of dollars a year earned by the pornography movie industry. Every one of the 70 buildings used to make and distribute pornography were damaged. The headquarters of the largest BCA pictures collapsed, destroying equipment and master copies of films. An executive of World Modeling, a San Fernando Valley agency supplying actors and actresses to the porn industry, said that clients, get this now, clients are backing away from X-rated acting as a result of the cataclysm. Our clients have a definite lack of motivation, said this agent for porn actors who requested anonymity. Notice, he said, that earthquake, it put the fear of God in them in telling you it's enough to give you an attack of religion. Too bad that lesson has been long forgotten. It is possible to conclude that the Northridge quake was a remedial judgment on the porn industry. I think so, yes. God is in charge of the weather. As Job said, sometimes he sends the storms for correction, sometimes for his land, so it can grow crops, and sometimes for mercy. What is happening at the UN Climate Change Conference with the worship of the earth goddess Gaia and the paganization of the environment is far more concerning to me than the temporary religious rush that accompanied the Northridge earthquake. The wrath of God on unrighteousness is about to pour down from heaven on all the ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And among the list of sins which provoke the wrath of God is on those who serve the creature rather than the creator. Today, the world's elite of the UN and the World Economic Forum have chosen to worship the goddess Gaia and blaspheme the God who created the heavens and the earth. That's what's going on in our world today. And uh, 